Our next speaker is Robin Eckersley. She's, professor, she's a professor in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Please welcome her to address this issue. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, Bogart Mullen and also Graham Pearman have already begun to put their finger on the core problem, or what I take to be the core moral problem of global climate change. It's like a double whammy of injustice that those nations, communities, classes that are least responsible for putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and who are least capable of adapting are the ones that are going to suffer the worst brunt of the impacts. So it's sort of adding insult to injury. But the problem is that these same parts of the world, particularly in Asia, especially in Africa, also in the Pacific, and to some extent in Latin America, need headroom for development because large swathes of their population are living below the poverty line. So we must find a way for cutting, to cut some slack for these countries to continue to develop, to improve the welfare of their people, which would also put them in a better position to be able to adapt to climate change. And so we have to ask the question, where should the cuts come from? Now this is a bit of a no-brainer, I think. The cuts come from the big emitters. The cuts come from those who are both historically responsible for most of the greenhouse gases in the, uh, in the atmosphere to date, and also from those that have the capacity. So the first is a simple application of the polluter pays principle from each according to their responsibility. The second is simply from each according to their capacity in order to fill the more basic egalitarian maxim to each according to their need. What you have here is a chart. It doesn't matter so much that you can't read the individual countries. Suffice to say that this is a graph showing per capita emissions. And countries in red are those with a, um, very high GNPs. And moving down to the very pale yellow, those with very low GNPs. And I think the picture tells a thousand words. America has a great big Yeti carbon footprint. Australia has a dubious distinction of coming third. And you'll see most developing countries have small, tiny, actually tiny, carbon footprints. So we need to talk about per capita footprints. Graham made the point that um, certain politicians in this, in this country keep saying that our aggregate emissions in Australia aren't very high, but we're still in the top 20% of countries in terms of high emissions. And if everyone said, well, our little bit doesn't add up to much, then we're not going to get very far. Now, this is my only slide on the science because I'll certainly defer to Graham Pearman here. But I think the bottom line that we're all working with here is we need to avoid a two degree warming. And to do that, the IPCC recommends that developed countries reduce their emissions in the next target period, that's the post Kyoto target period of 2013 to 2020, by somewhere in the range of 25 to 40 percent. Now, this is a rather daunting target, and, and I think the science has already been overtaken in terms of what was looked at by the IPCC in the fourth assessment report. Even a two degree warming gives us a mean or an average 50% chance of still going further. So would you get in an aeroplane if there was a 50% chance that it might fall out of the sky? Some of us are worrying about flying with Qantas at the moment, but I'm talking about a much more serious risk. So I think that a safer target would, if you're talking about worst case scenario, then a safer target would be a much bigger cut by developed countries by 2020. Something in the order of 50 to 80%, which is what a lot of pit folk take as their 2050 target. I'm not interested in 2050 targets. Politicians can stand up and tell me what their target is for 2050, but they'll be dead. I'm very interested in interim targets because it's early deep cuts that's going to protect us all, but particularly developed, developing countries. So the political challenge is how to allocate responsibility. I've already suggested some maxims, and these have partially, partly guided the parties in the climate change regime. The principle of common but differentiated responsibility seeks to um, embody the idea of historical capacity, or so, I beg your pardon, historical responsibility and capacity, and also acknowledge vulnerability because there's an inverse relationship between vulnerability and responsibility and capacity. So the Kyoto Protocol, I think we now need, need to look back on as a kind of warm-up test drive. 
The main game is the negotiation over the post-Kyoto Treaty. Kyoto merely asked the developed countries to have an average cut of about 5.2%. And that was not based on any objective formula for allocating responsibility. It was a bit of a kind of horse trading. Countries just said what they felt they could manage. Australia could manage an 8% increase. By 2012, the Europeans led the pack saying they could manage a 7% cut. No targets were given to developing countries precisely in observance of that principle of common but differentiated responsibility. They needed some slack to develop. They weren't responsible for most historical emissions and they didn't have the capacity to mitigate. But late last year, the parties met in a crucial meeting to start negotiations for a post-Kyoto treaty.